I, yeah. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody to the June, actually, the, as Lori pointed out, the summer solstice edition of Dashboard Diagnostics. And again, as we like to do from time to time, um, again, welcome everybody that may be new to this. Uh, this is a, a series that we started almost a year and a half ago, inspired by our friends at Vivio. And uh, in general, you know, the, the typical or traditional format is for us to take a club who volunteers to uh, share their portfolio. And they do it in one of two ways, either by identifying themselves and letting us all know who they are. And then other clubs have participated using our witness protection program where they can remain anonymous. And uh, basically what we have discovered is that uh, every portfolio tells a story. And uh, we've actually enjoyed some wonderful stories working with, you know, most recently the Plungers, a wonderful club out of the uh, near the Detroit area here in southeastern Michigan. We had the Beardstown Ladies around Valentine's Day and uh, Northern Traders, Lori's Club actually participated towards the end of last year and it's just a, a way to, to dig into the portfolios and see what type of stories and lessons we might actually be able to extract from them. And we've, I, don't, I don't know, I've never been disappointed, perhaps some of you have been, but I've never been disappointed by the type of stories that we can uh, come up with. And uh, Tonight we're going to take a little bit different tack. We're going to take a look at basically an aggregate portfolio of a whole bunch of you that you participate in it as a manifest subscriber. And we've entitled this Shop With Your Friends because what we're, we're going to do is take a look at the Manifest 40. I'll describe how it's uh, constructed here in a minute. But I'm uh, going to take a look at what the, the favorite stocks are within our community to track and follow and uh, spend some time looking at... Uh, current favorites from that group. So here's the portfolio we will actually be taking a look at. Again, a little bit of a break from our, our traditional format, but we're going to take a look at the Manifest 40, which we put out on a quarterly basis. Uh, I'm referring to it as a kind of a global thing because it, it involves clubs, individual investors, and it's got about a couple thousand participants. If we count uh, our prospects and some of the people just checking out the site, uh, the numbers are actually a little bit higher than that. We started it about six years ago, September of 2005, where we, we wanted to keep track of the companies that seemed to be of the, the most interest within the community. So we've been publishing this uh, list of top 40 um, based on the number of dashboards that the, the companies appear on and um, sharing that top 40 every, every quarter since September 2005. So again, it, it's there so we can pay attention to you know, put a little more emphasis on the stocks that are more widely followed. And uh, the second reason is, just as it says there, um, I, I know that you guys hear this from, you know, a variety of investing resources out there, but we actually care about how well our subscribers do. So we actually do uh, have some compassion for, and we want to know what, you know, in general, how are we doing as a group? So this becomes a resource to, to focus on those most widely held stocks and monitor performance trends. So we'll take a look at that also tonight. We're certainly not disappointed by what we see. Though the mountain is there simply for peak performance. It really comes down to a pretty simple concept. This is one that many of you are familiar with. We call it the Wisdom of Communities. It was our cover story in the June 2008 edition of our e-newsletter, Expected Returns. Uh, you can go back to it and check it out by either going to the, the issues and going back to that June 2008 issue, or you can simply type that in, manifest.com forward slash articles forward slash, and then you can see the rest there. So you can go straight to it um, by the link. But in a nutshell, what it, what it really comes down to is we know, we know when, that when it's done well, more heads are better than one. And I, I, could, I could tell stories for the next hour on this subject alone where there have been times when, when I was convinced that I had a, a, a good investing idea and basically a group of you, like-minded souls, talked me out of it. And there have been a number of times when that turned out to be a pretty good situation. Now, the flip side comes true every once in a while, but over the whole, we all seem to do better um, coming together as a like-minded group, comparing notes, and that's basically what we're going to do here tonight is take a look at, you know, what is the consensus out there right now, where does the interest seem to be, and then we'll spend some time with the companies that have, seem to have triggered the most recent interest within uh, the last few couple of months. You guys all know the drill. Here's our standard disclaimer. Uh, the key ones there at the top, no investment recommendation is intended. 
We do this to, to learn and share. Everything that we do here is for illustration only. Uh, we could be talking about stocks that we actually own. Um, got a pretty good feeling Lori owns at least one of them that we'll be talking about tonight. So again, it's stocks that we actually could actually own. We generally disclose that, but sometimes we might not remember. Here's some of that performance track record that we've been talking about. Um, again, we're, we're talking about nearly six years of performance. And if you take a look at the, the annualized total returns from the portfolio as a whole, it's a, it's a tracking portfolio or a, a model portfolio or an index or however you want to think about it, the 40 stocks that have been in the highest favor, the, the, getting the most attention from our community, have actually generated a return of about 5.5% over the last uh, five and a half, almost six years. Now that may not sound very good until you put it in the context of, you know, what do, what has the Wilshire 5000, that general stock market done? And that's what you see here. Uh, that's checking in at a little bit south of 2%. So again, our, our goal as a community is to, is to attempt to reach for, you know, strive for that 5% level and uh, generally be happy anytime we start getting in this type of a range over multi-year periods. So that plus 3.7% is what we call the, the relative return. Uh, many of you out there are familiar with Lori's work and the, the quest for uh, relative returns. That's what, that's what we're here, that's what, what this entire or the modern investment club movement is all about, is uh, helping people to understand and reach for 5% or more positive relative returns, you know, in, in a long-term investing track record. All right, we'll take the, the manifest 40 now and subject it to our traditional analysis, taking a look at the report card and comparing some of the key attributes. Uh, we know that the key attributes, the key characteristics that we pay the most attention to are the returns we expect from the portfolio, and then followed by quality and growth. And they're all important. I mean, we focus on returns a lot, but they're, they're all important. They're all towards the top end of the importance scale. Here's the report card on the left that you, uh, you see on any dashboard at Manifest Investing. And what that is telling us is that the, the average projected annual return, that's our return forecast for the stock, is just a little shy of 13%. Okay, we have to put that number in context. So what we do is we compare that, let's call it 13%, to the average or the, the middle technically the median stock among the, the 2,600 stocks or so that we cover, and we see that number right here. My par refers to the median projected return for the 2,600 stocks that we follow, and we see that that's about 8.5% right now. So our, our portfolio is built to outperform that by about 4.5%. That's what you see here. Uh, this is the, the portfolio par of 12.9% checking in right here, and you see that our target is in what we call the sweet spot, 5 to 10 percent above that. So we want to try to be in this range. You can see that that's a very small difference. Basically the, the, the tracking portfolio built from following the stacks that you guys are the most interested in, most widely followed, is uh, in pretty good shape relative to that, uh, that target range that we see there. Quality, we want the quality to be somewhere in that 75 plus or minus range. It might be anywhere from 70 to, to 80 don't want to go too high because uh, that would mean that you're being probably overly conservative unless you have certain personal characteristics that, that really make that desirable. Other, otherwise, we want to be somewhere in this target range of 70 to 80, and that certainly checks out here. Um, very, very high quality. That's no surprise. Any, uh, any group of investors or clubs influenced by the modern investment club movement is going to uh, basically gravitate to those type of companies. On growth, we want uh, we want enough growth. We want enough small, medium, and large companies to, to achieve. Uh, we typically shoot for about 11%, give or take a percent, as shown here by this target range right here. You can see that, again, the stocks that are in the tracking portfolio, the Manifest 40, check out just fine. The other characteristics are also strong and uh, in pretty good shape in general. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out tonight is that Basically, these two target ranges are relatively static or relatively fixed, is how you might want to think of them. And they, they, they don't move around. This one up here at the top on the projected return, uh, that target range moves around with the stock market. It, it's variable. It, uh, it could be as low as uh, 5 to 10 percent. It could be as high as 20 to 25 percent, depending on market conditions. So this one here will actually move around. 
these two are the two lower ones are relatively static or, or as I say they're fixed um, you might shoot for higher quality if you're uh, a more experienced investor and you want to do preservation of, of assets uh, you might shoot for a slightly less sales growth under those conditions if you're doing preservation of capital um, but you know once once you've decided who you are what you're aiming for those two are going to stay relatively uh, relatively static Here's a look at the sector diversification of the Manifest 40. You can see that it's fairly well distributed. Uh, our typical favorite sectors do um, most often in, in clubs we do see technology, healthcare, discretionary, staples pretty close. Um, a lot of the, the all-male clubs really are heavy into the industrials. Um, you can see that the financials have kind of fallen out of favor, but a, a pretty good split. No, no sector really tremendously overweighted, even though we have faced significant opportunities in technology and healthcare over the last couple of years. A couple sectors missing would be uh, utilities and um, basic materials, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's another one, well, telecommunications uh, that are completely missing. And again, uh, we would urge that uh, just shop for opportunities wherever they may be. Let's talk a little bit more about what we think is probably an order of magnitude more important, the size diversification. This is one of the, the founding pillars of what we do. Um, you want to make sure that you are diversified by size in your portfolios. I know we, we talk about this a lot. It never hurts to re well, repeat and remind. You basically want to have some of all of the above. You want to have uh, you know, some small, some large, and some medium companies in your portfolios, and you want, again, you want them to uh, build a portfolio that is in the 11% plus or minus range when you look at the overall average for the complete portfolio. Uh, we classify size based on the growth rate potential for the company. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail with Apple, but we, we regard a company that has a growth rate greater than 12 as a small company company that is less than seven is a large company. Now, I know that doesn't match up with some of the stuff that, that some of us have uh, been taught or brainwashed with, but uh, if you really sit back and you think about the life cycle of companies and how growth changes as a company ages and matures, you really want to be focused in on the growth characteristics. It's a core design fundamental of, of portfolios and uh, a really neat way, and plus then you only have to remember two numbers. Less than 7 is a large company, greater than 12 is a small company, and medium is everything in between 7 and 12. So it becomes pretty easy. Um, when, we, when we put together the enhancements to the website, I actually resisted putting together this graph on the right, um, really preferring the graph down here on the lower left, because this, the, the, this is the real key factor here, this 11% plus or minus. Um, it's, it's more important. Um, but... I think it's pretty clear that you could build a portfolio and make 11% with a really strange combination of all small and all large, or, or you know, all small and large, no mediums. We want to make sure that it, it is, you know, diversified across them all. So ultimately, um, my colleagues won the debate, and that's why the pie chart is available. Just to kind of hammer the point home, here are the the companies in the value line 1700. And really, just to give it some really strong con context, um, you know, we, we talk about shopping for companies that have 15% and higher growth rates. Again, I'm talking about growth here, not return, growth. Uh, how many companies do you see out here to the, to the far right-hand tail of this? Uh, it really is a bell curve. And the answer is not very many. And when you divide it into, uh, you know, 25% in, out to one end, you know, some, starting somewhere in here, these are your large companies this way, your small companies are this way, and then 50% of all companies, those medium-sized companies, fit into this range right here. So again, we want to shop for roughly a quarter of our portfolio from this group of companies here. You know, and again, you take a company like Procter & Gamble. When you look at it, and let's say the growth rate is approximately 5%. Is that a bad thing? And my answer to that is no. I mean, look at the number of companies that have 5% growth rates. Now, obviously, it's got to be balanced out with companies bought from this end of the spectrum for your smaller companies. But again, it's a matter of uh, spread them out. Buy some small, buy some medium, buy some large, and keep it that way. 
So let's go ahead and dive into the portfolio. Uh, we do publish this on a quarterly basis. Some of you have probably already studied it today because we put it out in the forum, uh, I think, this morning. Um, this is the second 20. The company's ranked from 21st to 40th in the Manifest 40. Uh, last quarter, we actually had a kind of a, a unique situation where we didn't have any companies exit the portfolio, so we had no new entries. Uh, the num number in parentheses is how the company ranked back in March, three months ago. So in this case, at the very top, you can see that number 21, Cognizant Technology, was in the number 22 slot back in March. So it's moved up one slot. When you see an asterisk down here, as it is for Infosys Tech, um, that's new to the top 40. Now, what that doesn't tell you is Infosys Technology has kind of been floating around at 41 or number 41 or number 42. And in fact, it was previously in the top 40. So it's basically floated back in, if you want to think of it that way. So again, we, we rank them by the number of dashboards. We do some filtering to take out uh, watch lists and inactive portfolios, but uh, the number of dashboards is what we use to build the, the Manifest 40. And we see some fairly interesting companies in here, your, your Buffalo Wild Wings, which have, has done pretty well for many of us. Um, CBS Caremark we talk about quite a bit. Uh, uh, there are a few companies that are suffering from uh, fairly significant challenges. We could talk for a while about this one. You know, is that a problem for Pfizer? And I'd say, yeah, it probably is. It's the reason that it's gone from a top five company down to the number 23 position. Uh, there's a couple other companies that have fairly low numbers. Home Depot used to be in the number one slot. And uh, Home Depot, thanks to what's going on in uh, the Great Depression in the housing market, um, has really been... Uh, hammered pretty badly and the, the growth expectations are still not anything to, to write home about. Um, we list the projected returns, take a snapshot and the quality ratings on, on the day that we issue the, the Manifest 40. Let's take a look at the top 20 now. These are the ones that are most widely held. You can see that the pole position, round of applause for that good Michigan company striker. It, it was in the number one position back in March. I think it's been there for at least nine months now. And it's a company that we follow along with you pretty closely here in um, the community. And yeah, you can see that it's got a pretty good uh, distribution on dashboards out there in the community. So a lot of your like-minded colleagues are following this company also. Decent projected return even after a pretty strong run-up in price. And it ranks among the, the top shelf quality ratings that we track at Manifest Investing. Anytime you get up into the upper 80s or 90s, you're probably up among the top dozen companies in the, the investing universe. So again, anything above 85 or so, you can see there's only a couple on this list. Uh, your Fastenals, Backset, and Stryker, um, again, rank amongst the highest quality companies in the universe that we track. Um, companies here that have faced some challenges, well, this one's no stranger to anybody. And some of us, some of you, are getting a little bit tired that... Uh, the characteristics or trends at General Electric are, are not real strong either on the growth side. And it's uh, actually slipped from uh, a top three position down to the, the number seven slot here recently. Now the flip side of that is the companies, and we're going to talk about a few of them here tonight, uh, companies like Apple that have gone from number eight to number 12. I got that backwards from number 12. That's what it was back in March up to number eight now. And uh, this one has been real strong. Uh, it's something that many of you have been kicking around and talking about for a while. It was recently voted into the Challenge Club portfolio last week. Uh, it was featured as a Solomon Select uh, company in the June newsletter. So it's, it's one that we've been kind of hovering around, and we'll be taking a closer look at Teva, Apple, and, and one other tonight. But again, it's just a, a collection of the stocks that are most widely followed um, by, the, by our community. Oh, the third one we're going to talk about is down here. It's also been on quite a roll in terms of interest level uh, bioreference labs. Let's talk a little bit about how the performance um, segments or breaks down a little bit. This is that relative return annualized, which comes out to that 3.7% number collectively. Um, this, this is where I refer to this as the, the barbershop or hair salon slide. Um, if you happen to hold cognizant technology in your portfolio for the last uh, four or five years, that's how long it's been in in the Manifest 40. Um, it has outperformed the Wilshire 5000 
by 66% per year over that uh, three or four year period. So that's obviously the one we like to talk about at the, at the neighborhood barbecue. The flip side of that would be these companies down here. We already talked a little bit about GE. Um, Strayer, of course, is under assault. Uh, federal government's trying to restructure the business model. And uh, that's down significantly from where it was uh, added on enough dashboards to make the Manifest 40. But uh, some of these others have been um, basically pretty powerful stocks for us. And uh, from Buffalo Wild Wings, Fastenal, Faxet, uh, I joke about Oracle being an adopted member of our family. This one counts too. We've, we've had some shares of Faxet for years. And then uh, Apple, which we're going to talk about tonight, even though it's, it's had such strong performance over the last couple of years, while it's been in the Manifest 40, it continues to have uh, pretty strong interest. And that's also true here with quality uh, systems. Both of those companies, even though they've been uh, strong contributors, they continue to have a fairly high active level of interest. Um, this is just a reminder. We call this our accuracy. Um, about 50% of the stocks in the 40, about 20 of the 40 have outperformed the market while in the, the tracking portfolio. Any questions at this point, Lori, or things that we should explore? Uh, John Kimmel was just asking that he said he had heard that Bar Labs is heavily shorted, and he wondered if that was a positive or a negative sign. Now, we might need a little clarification. Bar Labs was acquired by... Teva Pharmaceutical, and I'm 99% sure that it's no longer. I don't, I don't mean bar, bar Labs. I mean. Oh, uh, Bio Reference bio Labs. Reference. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Well, we can we can talk talk about that. Um, it would probably explain some of the the price sluggishness that we have seen. So perhaps we can dig into that a little bit later. I do not follow um, or track shorting. I did years ago, and I ne I never came up with a you know what I consider to be a solid algorithm or anything that could, could be meaningful information to me. Um, we have tracked some companies that have been shorted by uh, people like Whitney Tilson. We, in fact, one of the sessions, one of the dashboard diagnostic sessions a few months ago where we did something a little different, took a look at Tilson's short positions on Netflix, which he subsequently closed at a tremendous loss. Um, you know, it, it can it can pay to pay attention to the short sellers and the short selling volume. Uh, perhaps John and I can talk about uh, you know what we might watch for and you know what that might mean to us as investors. Anything else? I don't see anything.